Well, I was born in Montreal, and um, I um, went to McGill, and uh, then I went to the University of London in England, and then after I come home, came home, a few months after I came home, I met my husband, and we came to London in 1967 because he um, had a position in the Faculty of Medicine at Western. I still have a, a composition book from grade 10 where I was called, I think, My Ambition, and the first sentence says, My ambition was to have a career in an artistic field. So I had the notion early on, I can't tell you why I had that idea, but I did, because, you know, I grew up in a small town, there wasn't an art gallery. There were artists, though, and I certainly knew some of the artists. So, and we had, actually, as I think of it, we had in elementary school, we had an itinerant art specialist who came once a week to teach art. And I think that had a big influence, as I think. But there was no high school art program, but um, so that was the very, very beginning. And when I came to London, I knew before I came that there were artists working here. And we were very lucky because 1967 was the year that they started the Fine Arts Department at Western. And it's also when the country began to be aware of the artists who were working here, such as Greg Kernow and Jack Chambers and Murray Favreau and Tony Urquhart. There was a whole cadre of younger artists who were becoming known on the national scene. So the timing was fortuitous, as it turned out. Well, um, one of the early things I did was I became a member of the vol that we called that was called the Junior Women's Committee at the London Art Gallery. And as part of that, we went to artist studios. And I remember going to Greg's studio, it must have been probably before 1970, as part of that group. And we also, there were lectures, and then I became what we called a docent. That's Latin for they, they teach, and it's what we now call tour guides in, here in London. And uh, so that was a way of meeting artists and learning more about the works hanging on the walls, and that was important to me. I'd already had the opportunity to do a studio course and one course in art history after I returned to Montreal from England. So I, I knew that art history was something I was really interested in, and um, it was a way, you know, we were, times were really different then because I was a young mother at home with small children, um, one child when we first came, and uh, so it was a way of keeping your mind working really and meeting interesting people and the friends that I made in that group are still friends today 50 years later so it was a pivotal moment and uh, gradually you know became more involved because we met in the evenings and we designed programs we raised money uh, we did something called the Art Mart which was really fun I think that was probably about 1970 and that uh, was a community event where 3,000 people came to the opening and people bought works. And uh, I think actually famously one of the big patrons in London, Jake Moore, bought his first Grey Colonel work at the Art Mart. So it's, uh, you know, it was a fun, it was fun, really. It was fun, but it was also intellectually stimulating. There, there were always women artists around. Um, in the Heart of London exhibition, there were, as I recall, 11 artists, and only one was a woman, and her name was in the catalog. It's Bev Kelly. She's now known as Beverly Lambert. And it's interesting because I met with her in Newfoundland just a couple of months ago when you were there, because I've been trying to find one of her works for the permanent collection at Museum London, because we have don't we have a couple of works and she gave me some drawings but we don't have one of the three works that was in that Heart of London exhibition and yet we have works by all of the men so that perhaps says something in itself uh, there were many women working um, I think Margot Aris was married to Herb Aris who was uh, in charge of Beale Art School and was very influential on people like Murray Favreau and, and um, Greg Kernow and Jack Chambers. But um, I went to see 
to their house once to the studio for some reason and I was interested that that Herb had a huge studio and Margot who was a potter and a very interesting artist had a little tiny corner and that to me resonates a little bit about what it was like in the in the 60s Well, it was, it was a, a roundabout way. Um, I kept up the volunteering, but I had, when I did that one course at McGill in art history, I discovered it was the one subject that I absolutely loved studying. It wasn't work. And so uh, I had the notion, because we had the new visual arts department of eventually, fine arts it was called, going there. So I talked to a friend and she said to me, well, you should go up and see what the schedule is because you'll have to figure out, find a course that you can do at a particular time. And so I went up when I had a babysitter and I looked at the schedule and the secretary saw me in the hall and she said hello and she asked me why I was there. And so I told her and she said, well, she said, you should have an interview with the chairman of the department and can you come Friday at nine o'clock? So I kind of gulped and said, okay. And she said, do you have a portfolio? And she said, I said, yes, but it's 20 years old. And she said, you should bring it. So I um, then discovered that I couldn't, I couldn't find someone to substitute for me driving children to a summer program. And so I said to my husband, you know, I can't even get to the interview. What am I doing thinking about going back to school? The night before, the father of the other little girl called and said, I hear you have a problem, I can drive the girls. So I went and I had an interview with um, Professor Jose Barrio Garay, who was newly arrived. And he listened to what I'd done and looked at the portfolio and he said, you know, he said, you should take my course. I think it was called Understanding the Visual Arts. Because even if you don't do another course, that will be useful for what you're already doing. But I did have a really interesting volunteer job as chairman of the art committee. Uh, we were given money. It was actually from Walter Blackburn, who owned the London Free Press and who was on the board of the hospital, to buy art for the hospital. And I was sitting there and I volunteered to be on the committee. And after a year, I became the chair. And I did that for eight years. And so we bought works and we had exhibitions in the lobby and outside the cafeteria. And I loved it because it was taking art into places where people worked and I learned quite a bit um, doing that and worked with a lot of local artists who had who were happy to have a show up there where hundreds of people were walking by and uh, so that was also something that I had been doing and till I went back to school. So I went back to school and I knocked off the courses you know in between and eventually I had enough that the next step was um, to do a master's degree and there wasn't one here and I had various there were various reasons why I didn't think I could do it at that particular time and then I heard that there was an opening at um, what they called the London Regional Art Gallery at the time as the education officer it was called <laughs> so um, I went got an interview and I went down and said I've got the art history training but I also have you know a certificate in education from the University of London and I had taught high school for four years I don't think I said that so I said you know I I would really like this job and so I got it and um, that was the beginning and it was part-time to begin with and then it became full-time and my daughter who's now a social worker I remember her saying to me when I was debating about whether I could manage to be full-time she said mom she said, hire someone to do all the things you don't like doing, like the laundry and the rest of it, and take the job. And that was very good advice. So I made a list of all the things that I could offload to someone else, like watering plants and making lunches for the school lunches, and um, that was it. The first task I had as chief curator it was the anniversary of the 50th anniversary of having an art gallery in the city of London so the idea was to get as much of the permanent collection out as possible and especially a focus on London artists so that was quite a challenge to do that and um, there were there are many I mean often I wasn't actually curating the exhibition I was coordinating because we had um, a tradition of hiring guest curators 
And that also was very interesting because you were always working with someone who had, I, who was inter, who was the interface between the artist and the exhibition, and you would find see how people had different ideas about things. So that was a good learning experience. Well, um, again, that came from volunteering. And that's been, if there's one theme, it's been volunteering that has been very useful for me. So I had to leave my uh, position at Museum London because I had a number of health problems. And uh, so I ran into Matthew Teitelbaum, who had started his career at the London uh, Regional Art Gallery. Brenda Wallace had hired him and he was then working at the AGO. So we were good friends and I said, you know, Matthew, I'm going to get a computer. This is 95, remember. It sounds like the dark ages, as my son would say, but I, and I'm going to get hooked up to the internet and I could do research. I, I volunteer for a research project if that would be helpful. So he called me about two weeks later and he said, I have two projects for you and you can't talk about them. So one of them was the, they had just literally swept up all the uh, paper material from Jack Chambers' studio and taken it to the AGO. And they were also going to be given 135 works of Greg Kernos, plus eventually his archives. So the first job was to go to Greg's studio and catalog the 135 works. And then um, Matthew said, well, we have to get you to Toronto, so I want you to come and catalog Jack Chambers' archives. So I started to do that. So I always had this notion of doing um, a master's degree, and um, I used to joke and say I was doing it to get the qualifications for the job I'd already had, but I really did it for me because I think, you know, at the bottom of a lot of this is that I do like scholarly work. So I applied and I was accepted and so while I was cataloging Colonel's archive and eventually working on the big Colonel exhibition, I went up to U of T, I could walk, and took a course a term. And so at the end of the five and a half years I had, you know, a book, this one, with the chronology in the back and the bibliography for Greg Colonel. And, um, and an MA in the history of art from U of T. So it was a very profitable time for me. Well, I did know him early on. I said I'd been to the studio and his children were at the French school where my children were. So I remember seeing him in the schoolyard. And um, he, I remember going to exhibitions at Forest City Gallery and he was there and sometimes, one time I went uh, when it was uh, one floor down from his first studio about at the foot of Carling Street and he was there minding the gallery and so we had a good talk about the art. And, um, but it was mostly a professional relationship but he, um, I think I did tell you that he and a group of other people got involved in what was happening to Lo the downtown of London. And uh, so we had this group that he formed with Peter Debra, who was the Dean of Journalism at Western. I think he was still Dean, he might have been retired, called Save London. So we met and there, were, there, were, there was, it was a fairly large group, maybe about 20 people drawn from different backgrounds. And the reason he asked me to do that was that I'd been quite involved, still am actually, in the Neighborhood Association in my own neighborhood. So there were other people like me who had worked in neighborhood associations and we had several events downtown. One of them was called uh, Hands Around the Block. It was the time when the Talbot block was going to be demolished and people were understandably upset about that. There was a lot of history that had to do with art and artists in that block and so we actually had enough people to have hands all the way around the block where um, the John uh, Budweiser is right now. So so that was uh, another, that was a way in which I knew about him sort of out of the gallery scene so to speak. You know that at the beginning of my career, I was 
we called it, I was the director of public programs, but instead of calling it the education department, because I had the feeling that people wanted, uh, it was the leisure time, and that they didn't necessarily want to be educated whenever they dropped in to see an art gallery. So we, we uh, planned a lot of programs, and I had a lot of fun actually with doing uh, different programs. But one of the parts of my job was training the tour guides, the docent that I used to be. And uh, so that was a bit of a challenge, and that's where the teaching, teacher's training really helped because um, we changed the method so that instead of having the tour guides lecture people on what they were looking at, it was more what we call the Socratic method, where the, the tour guide asks the people questions and then elicits the answers to the questions. And in the process, you can do a good job of making the people feel more comfortable with the work. So I was um, became aware that if we had a trained tour guide standing in the gallery who could talk to people about the works, that, that was good. But 90% of the people who came to the gallery didn't have that opportunity. So I came up with an idea of um, using a computer. This was probably in 84, 85, and many times in galleries they were using computers, but they were using them to give out information. And my approach was totally different. It was to be used as a teaching tool and to teach people how to look at a work of art. And if they could look at one and feel comfortable with it, then maybe they could feel comfortable with another one. So I worked with uh, the computer science department at Western. Professor Andrew Zillard was the professor who agreed to do it. And I was a, a supervisor of the fourth year thesis. And so we did, I think about eight, but one of the ones that we did was Greg Colonel. We didn't have time to work out um, an on, uh, program about comments afterwards on the computer. And anyway, it seems hard to believe now, but people had a hard time typing. Not everybody knew how to type in the 1980s. And so I just got an exercise book and a pencil and put it beside on a little desk that we had. The proprietors made a special desk for the computer. And so it was filled. And one of my favorite comments was about feeding Percy. And it said, I would have walked right by this work if the computer hadn't been there. And uh, now I understand the work, but I still don't like it. And I thought, well, you know, you can't do any better than that. If, if we can make everybody feel that way, that they could come in and be comfortable looking at contemporary work of art, that was always the thing that I was trying to do, to be the bridge between the person walking in and the work on the wall. I'm still, I'm still working uh, as a volunteer at Museum London, raising money for the new Center of the Forks, which um, I was in the other day. It's coming along, and it's going to transform that building. And it's the, the project involves the very space that I was programming years ago. So that's why I became so interested in seeing it turned back into a place where there would be uh, more um, interaction between people, more participatory programming that would be a link between the visitor and the work of art. Something that wouldn't necessarily be contemplative. It'll be art classes, uh, there'll be digital material, it'll be a way of accessing the permanent collections. It's a, it's a huge project and um, it's going to open soon and I think it'll be a game changer for the way people experience Museum London. So I guess, yes, I'm still Still working on that theme, I guess you're right. Well, with a lot of help from my family to begin with, from my husband, who was very supportive, who said that I had supported him at the beginning of his career. And so he, he was very, um, he, he's always there. You know, he comes to the openings, he still does. He's always been very supportive about it. And um, I hired a lot of really good people to help me out at home because um, I was able to do that and uh, it was important. I learned that, uh, I learned it one day when I happened to be here, that, that the, my children liked the fact that there was someone in the house when they came home from school. They didn't, want, didn't like coming home when there was no one there. And it didn't have to be me, it was just 
there had to be someone there. And uh, so, so that was a bit of a revelation. And, you know, they were all very supportive of the idea as well. And they, I think they're all art collectors now as a result because they spent a lot of time at, uh, at Museum London. And um, you have to have a lot of energy. And um, I still have downstairs, actually. I found it, came across it. I had a book. And I, every day I would write out the instructions for what had to be done. And I was looking at it and I was thinking, oh my goodness. I would say, make such and such, there's something in the refrigerator and the recipe is page. So, you know, I'd put the recipe books out and then this needs to be done and that needs to be done. So you had to be highly organized because, of course, I was also doing the same thing at work. So um, you have to make lists, a lot of writing down, crossing out, and uh, you get a lot of support from other people. But I have to tell you, it's not easy. And one of the things that you wouldn't know about was that it was very hard to go from being a housewife to being a professional. Because you lose your confidence when you're at home and dealing with household tasks. And I had always managed, you know, to do something else, like if it was the Junior Women's Committee or going back to school, to try to keep my mind going. But it's not the same as being in a position. And it's, um, it's interesting. I was talking to someone recently, and we were talking about resumes. And um, I never put the fact that I had three children and a husband in my resume. But women do that now because it was there were value judgments about you. I, I was actually on a board and we were hiring, in the process of hiring someone and one of the older men at the table said, she's just a housewife. And this was a woman who was definitely not just a housewife. And so I remember I actually stood up to it and we ended up hiring that particular person. But, you know, it was, that was in the 1990s, no, that was, yeah, that was in the 19, late 1990s, where you still ran into these, these attitudes from someone who had really a very strong resume. So it's, women have come a long, long way. When I went back to study visual arts at McGill for the first time, and the chair of the department, when he found out I was married at the age of 26, told me he didn't want married Westmount matrons cluttering up his courses was the direct quote. So he had to stand up to that. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it hasn't been a huge fight, but, and, and mostly I've really had, I've had a wonderful career. I have been so, so lucky. And this career that kind of is a bit crazy, but has been very satisfying and still seems to be going on in one way or another. But volunteering is the key. <laughs>
But um, all the arts, like the theater and the music and so on, it was what makes life worthwhile for many people. And I'd like to see more people get to know that.